another example of this wishful thinking strategy that I really love that we all use all the time, but we probably don't even think of it as an example of this strategy, is when you want to solve something like this. Say, oh man, it's got x squared and 2x. This is a pain. If it just had x squared, it would be easy. <coughs> boy, it would be nice if I just had something squared there. So, boy, I wish I had a plus 1 here. This would just be so much easier. That would just be great, because then I have this nice perfect square. But this is math, right? Your wishes come true. If you want a plus 1 there, you get it. You just have to either subtract one there or add one on the other side of the equation, whichever you like better. And now I have what I wished for, a perfect square. And now it's so much easier to solve this problem. Right? So it's just, you know, in math, your wishes come true. Wishful thinking is a, is a great strategy. Okay. So I want to make one last uh, distinction about things. This is my list of problem solving strategies. And this could apply to a lot of things. I mean, first of all, not just math, but certainly not any one particular area of math for sure. So there's strategies, you know, like these big picture things. Completing the square, I would call something more like a tool. You use it over and over again. It's reusable. It's not like a one-shot deal. But it's like a specific example of a use of one of the strategies, or it's a technique that's going to help you finish the problem. Um, so. The tools are things like completing the square that if you try to tell an English teacher about them aren't going to make much sense. And the strategies are the things like wishful thinking where everybody can understand. Oh, wishful thinking, I get it. It's like a what if thing. Maybe in social studies you use that to help analyze, you know, what if the Archduke had not been assassinated? What would World War I have looked like or would it not have happened at all or whatever? Um, you know, working backwards, well, how did we get to where we are? Let's look at the history of how we got here and so forth. Um, and do something, right? Don't English teachers teach that too? When you have a, don't sit there looking at a blank piece of paper when you have an essay to write. Just start writing something, and if you end up throwing away all the stuff that you wrote in the first 15 minutes, that's fine, because at least you've broken through that barrier of getting started, and it's, it's the same thing in math. I have a question. Yeah. Did, did, that, did your feelings about do something, did that come out of nuclear engineering or submarine? No, it came out of watching students and I ran across the quote and I tied it to what anxiety does, fear does, mm -hmm. fear immobilizes. And mm -hmm. many of our students, as a teacher, I, most of you teachers, you've probably seen a student with fear in their eyes. They really don't know what to do. And I realized, and it also came from standing at the board and being uncomfortable because the student will ask, how do we do that one? And I hadn't worked that problem yet. And I tell them, I get the same rush of anxiety thinking about not being able to do this problem in front of 28 kids, that I finally got to the point where I just start writing things. And I realize that sometimes I'm stalling because I really don't know the strategy I'm going to use to solve this problem. So I start writing down the knowns. I start writing. And I think it really ties back to I think, brain psychology and, and anything. When you are afraid, the best thing to do is start doing something. Because so it's, and I, I know it's hard to convince students of that. Draw a I mean, some of the techniques, draw a picture, uh, all those things I think have more than just the goal of solving the problem. They have to do with physiologically allowing you to actually begin to think more clearly. That's a good one. I should write that down, too. Um, okay, so, uh, yeah, I wanted to say something else about that. So, to me, that's a big part of the point of teacher circle. I think the biggest success people imagine is teachers will say something like, well, when I came in, I did not want to coach the math to you because I didn't know all of that math. And now my math knowledge is at a point where I can do all those problems. That, to me, is not what it's about. What it's about is, before, I used to be scared of getting up in front of the room full of math contest kids and not knowing how to do the math contest problems. And now I know it's OK if I don't know how to do those problems. And we can look at the strategies and struggle through it together. And that that's a really productive experience for the kids to see the modeling of what do you do when you run into a problem you don't know how to solve. And it's not something that you have to feel bad about being up at the board and not knowing how to do the problem that the kids are supposed to be working on. That, to me, is the big success story is when I get that kind of feedback from teachers who participate in the circle is that they're now comfortable with the fact that if it's a problem, that means people don't necessarily know how to do it, and that's okay.